cybernetics as the bigger picture. And there's certain well, parts of constructivism that lend themselves toward cybernetics. Probably. I, I, I'm inclined to agree with that. All the preparations. It's like taking off on a hang glider. Yeah. With all the preparations, you know, everything has to be straightened out. Well, if you want a definition of cybernetics, you can get it from Norbert Wiener, which is the study of communication and control in animals and the machine. But if you look at the history of cybernetics, uh, a very peculiar thing happened. Because after it became a discipline, which was after the Macy conferences in the 1940s, and Wiener had sort of was publishing his book, and with the help of Heinz and Warren McCulloch, uh, a discipline was founded. And because Wiener and also McCulloch had been working very much on the technological applications of cybernetics, which is circular reactions and feedback mechanisms and all that, for several years, cybernetics was concerned exclusively with technological applications. And you got all those wonderful things like uh, uh, automatic pilots and uh, goal-seeking missiles and all that. And they were fabulous technological advances. Now, Wiener and McCulloch and Heinz and several others at the beginning, had been very interested in the philosophical applications of cybernetics, but not very much was done about them early on. And that took until about, I think, the late 60s before uh, things like that came out. And that, if you like, then became the birth of second-order cybernetics, where the focus was no longer on a scientists doing things with things, but it was on the scientist, scientist himself. It, the beginning of that was the book that Heinz edited called Observing Systems. The focus was on systems that do the observing, and that do the thinking, and that do the exploiting and all that. So that was the second order cybernetics. Mm -hmm. That, I think, one has to know if you talk about cybernetics, because today the, the second field is as important as the first application. It's, it's the philosophical things that have slowly begun to influence other areas. It's a very slow process, and uh, part of that is because of the revolutionary ideas that are introduced by cybernetics into philosophy, which is all based on self-organization and the same things as the technological advances, but applied to intellectual proceeds and what not. Now, cybernetics has been defined since then in many different ways, but uh, I have my own definition, of which, of course, I'm fonder than of all the other definitions, and it is that cybernetics is the art of living or choosing between constraints, finding possibilities between constraints. Uh, I got to that definition originally because uh, Gregory Bateson uh, had written an article about evolution and the theory of evolution. And in that article, he had made very clear that the theory of evolution is not a causal theory, but it is a theory that works by constraints. And it was that that made me realize that, indeed, 
that seemed the most uh, salient characteristic of cybernetics, that it is interested in constraints and not in causes. And the interest in constraints means that you learn to sort of cope with constraints by finding other possibilities with, that don't conflict with the constraints. And that indeed is, is very much the picture of evolution, where those organisms survive that do not hit fatal obstacles during their existence. the art and science of maintaining equilibrium in Very a world good, yes. of constraints and possibilities. Yes. Well, I know you want to put science in no. it. I don't. Okay. No. Can you say why? Why not? Why not? Well, because science is essentially built on causal relationship. And causal relationships are not important in cybernetics. And Bateson made that clear. And Gregory Bateson yes. made that clear. Uh, yeah, he suggested it. <laughs> yeah, right. I guess he didn't make it clear. Well, he suggested it because I think I'm one of the very few people who got it out of his writings. Yes. Lots of people have read Bateson, yeah. but they didn't get that out of it. Well, it's one way of looking at the world, you see. Yeah. Yeah, one way. You mustn't ever think that it's the only way of looking at the world. No. Never. Okay. The, the notion of equilibrium, of course, comes directly from Piaget. And it's, uh, it's intimately connected with the notion of viability. Viability is whatever allows you to maintain your equilibrium. The viability is the ability of something that you are doing to get past the obstacles. You do not do away with the obstacles, but you go around them. First order cybernetics is concerned with mechanisms that you are looking at and that you are constructing and that you are controlling. Second order cybernetics is concerned with the constructor, the observer and the controller. How do they manage to do it? And that is why second order cybernetics is interesting for cognition First order cybernetics is not interesting for cognition. Yeah. I don't want to devaluate first order cybernetics at all. I think some of the things that have come out of it are wonderful. Sure. And uh, we all know it. I, mean, I, I think they have it in refrigerators today. There are, um, there are chips that are implementations of first order cybernetics. The cars today with all the automatic braking systems and all those, that's all first order cybernetics. But in order to get a driver of a car, you have to do a little more. So you have to get into the second order. Well, you like my definition that cybernetics is the art of creating and maintaining equilibrium in a world of constraints and possibilities. How do you create anything in the world of constraints and possibilities? By trying. Either you bump into a wall and it doesn't work, or you get through. I have to tell you the story of how your definition affected my life. Okay? That's dangerous. <laughs> no, it's, it's, I think you'll appreciate the story. It was snowing 
icy, freezing snow, ice. And we live on a hill. And so one day we left to go down the hill to go to the store. And just as I was going down the hill, a big, big truck comes up, turns towards coming up the hill. I, I go to stop the car and you know what happens. I start sliding right towards the huge brown truck. And automatically I just go like this. And the next thing you know, I'm hitting the curb. And then I bounce off the curb, but miss the truck. And I start going back towards the truck. So I go like this, do a 360 turn, but never hit the truck. <laughs> and it was what? constraints. You were lucky. I was lucky. <laughs> Sometimes you begin to talk about life with your student, you know. And when that happened, I used to say to them, you know, I'm sure you know people of whom you say that they're lucky because things go well for them. What does it mean? It means that they have the courage and uh, the gumption, if you like, to take opportunities as they come. If at the age of 20 you have a fixed itinerary that you want to do this and this and this and at the age of 55 or 60 you're going to retire from that job and whatnot, your life is going to be dismal. You, you must have some goal at the moment. But then if something turns up that you find more interesting, you have to be ready to change. You have to be open to possibilities. If you're not, you're never going to be lucky.